Hello, this is Candidate Conversations. I'm Nick Gibson, a local government reporter for the Spokesman Review, and I'm here with Ted Cummings, a Democratic candidate for a representative position in Washington's 4th Legislative District. Ted, welcome. Thank you, Nick. It's great to be here. Yeah, and thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. Uh, So we've been starting these conversations kind of just with your pitch. Uh, So why should voters uh, elect you this November? Uh, Well, I think I'm the best suited candidate to uh, help the needs and address the needs of the people in the 4th and and in eastern Washington. Um, I'm proud of the the work that I've done in negotiating union contracts. Um, Also, I believe that this election is about character and competency. Um, Rob Chase has been in uh, office before. Uh, He was voted out. And I think there's a reason for that. I don't think we need to go back and repeat the mistakes. I, I believe that uh, my skill set of uh, being able to work with uh, different parties and groups, uh, plus my integrity, uh, makes me the most qualified and suited candidate. Also, the fact that I believe in making decisions using science and data and subject matter experts. So I want to get informed opinions and credible opinions and work with every party involved. And, and I think I've shown that during my career as a, as a union official and in just the way I've conducted my life. Well, I appreciate that. Um, before we kind of get into the issues, I wanted to explore your background a little more. You touched on it a little bit there. Um, this is not your first time uh, on the ballot. You've run for uh, the Senate. You've run for the county commission before. Uh, so what kind of motivated you to throw your hat in the ring again this year? So growing up, uh, my father and I love my father very much, but he uh, used to watch the news and he'd, he'd listen to a politician and uh, he'd shout at him, you know, and disparage him. And I'm like, Dad, well, you realize they can't hear you. If you feel that strongly, why don't you run for office? Um, fast forward to the later part of my life, I ended up in a labor dispute, a really horrible situation where in the end, the bad guy won. The This corporate Raider uh, uh, took a half a billion dollars in cash and closed the mill that I worked at, um, and it was all it was all just malignant and vicious. He wanted to hurt the community. He wanted to break the steelworkers union. Um, I saw the effects of that, how that labor dispute tore families apart and uh, ruined a, a, a thriving business, an essential business, I believe. And I was angry that uh, my senator, who said that they were going to stand with us. Um, I felt let me down. And so I was out bucking bales with a buddy that worked in the, the mill in like 2010. And just over, the elections were just over, the incumbent was reelected again and had been in office for like going on three decades. I said, in 2016, if she's still in office, I'm going to run against her. And, you know, of course, you say a lot of crazy things talking to buddies, but six years went by and I never forgot that promise I made. So I... I felt that I had a duty. I had something to say. I I felt that our country was on the wrong direction, that working people had been forgotten, and I ran for office. I thought it would be a one and done. I didn't want to be 85 years old and say, I almost did something once. I I wanted to step out there and really put myself out there and see, you know, if my thoughts, my message resonated. And it, it turned out they didn't. I was, uh, we were talking earlier off camera or off um, line about Jim Camden, and he wrote this article about the nuts running in this race. There was 19 people or 18 people in the race. And I get that. I get it was crazy and, and all that. But it was important to me, and I enjoyed every minute of it. And like I said, I thought I'd be a, a one and done. Uh, two years go by, and there's another candidate in the fourth running unopposed. He's a right-to-work person and turns out, you know, he became uh, known as a domestic terrorist. He was censured and, you know, removed from his position or his, his committees. And uh, This is Representative Matt Shea. Yeah, so I got right? into that race because, it, again, no one was going to run against him. People said at the time, well, you know, you can't do that. It's dangerous. You shouldn't do that and all that. And, and to me, it was like, well, that's all the more reason that I had to. So after that race was over and, and I— lost that race again. Um, I was interviewed immediately after, and I was still pretty disappointed. And I said, you know what, I will never let a uh, Republican run unopposed. And I've kept my word so far. Um, In 2020, 
there was uh, someone that wanted to run for the state representative. I don't want to run against another Democrat. So I was glad to step aside. But the county commissioner race was open. There was no one challenging the incumbent there. So I moved over there. And that's how I ended up here again is there was no one stepping up to run in the state representative position. And both seats that were open at the time. In fact, uh, position one doesn't have a Democrat in it, which I'm disappointed about. So that's what, that's what motivated me. And as I got into the process and I learned more, I learned how ignorant I was about politics and about the process. Here I had blamed the senator, the sitting senator, and I had no idea how sick and uh, misguided my country and my nation had become. And we see these politics now with this MAGA extremist movement that's openly, you know, um, ran an insurrection against our own government totally just outside the bounds of being an American, being a law-abiding citizen, and, and really this attack at the same time on journalism, on science, on experts, on you know, our institutions that we absolutely need to be a successful country, the FBI, the DOJ, the CDC, the FDA, and on and on. They're being attacked from within by the party, but they're also being attacked above by a, a stacked Supreme Court that has an an alternative motive or a different agenda than following the Constitution and protecting and acting in the best interests of Americans. So I know that was a long-winded answer to your simple question, but I I got into it because I had something I wanted to say, and I wanted to say it publicly. And in doing that, I learned about the needs of my community, about the different groups that don't feel safe and secure. It breaks my heart in in it. it really incenses me, but it motivates me. I want to represent everybody in the fourth, no matter who they are, no matter what they believe, no matter who they love, and on and on, because that's how we're going to get security and prosperity. When everybody has justice and everyone is treated fairly, uh, we will all do better. Well, thank you. I appreciate you going into that. Um... Hey, I'm a politician, man. I... <laughs> Don't ask me a simple question and just yes or no, because I, I got a lot to say about That's everything. Fair. That's fair. <laughs> Cut me off, though, if I get too crazy. Of course. No worries. <laughs> um, well, well, let's transition to this race. Uh, what do you kind of see as the top issues facing the district right now? Well, it, in my mind, it's obviously affordable housing. We can't have uh, you, you know a satisfied populace with the way things are now. But I, I've said this time and time again. It took 40 years of bad economic policy to get us where we are, and we're not going to get out of it overnight. Now, if you're a person without a home and you're on the street or struggling to stay in your home, that's not an answer that's going to make you happy, and I understand that. I understand all the anger and and frustration out there. I mean, they're absolutely right. Uh, uh, Wages haven't kept up with the cost of living, Uh, but We can address this by increasing supply, by working together, working collaboratively on a state, federal, and local level. And and we need to. And that's why I'm so so passionate about winning this race, because I believe I'm best suited to gather, you know, or work with everyone that's established or come up with new ideas to increase the supply of affordable housing. And we can walk and chew gum, right? While we're focused on that, that doesn't mean we're going to forget about crime or homelessness or uh, the substance abuse where we've seen in the news so much about small business owners suffering from people uh, living on their doorsteps and all the problems that go with that. That's unacceptable. And we need to address that. And we can, but we have to have serious people in there to address these issues, not distract us with a myriad of other uh, issues. And, and I hope we get a chance to talk about those. Yeah. Well, let's stick with housing kind of on that. I, I was hoping to ask you about um, annual rent caps. Um, there's the idea of, of putting a limit on how much um, rent can be increased in a given year. Uh, that's been floating around the legislature for a while now. I think last year it was around 7%. Uh, nothing was enacted, but um, is that something that you'd be interested in pursuing or supportive of? You know, I think everything's on the table. Everything's on the table. Um, getting people in homes they can afford um, is in everyone's best interest. I, I totally get the investment that uh, homeowner or people that rent or uh, landlords have. A hundred percent, I get it. But we also have to look at it as... Uh, 
this is the very reason we have government to respond to what is a crisis. Um, housing, affordable housing is a crisis. I look back at my first home. Um, my wife and I spent every weekend when, when we had weekends off together going through the paper, the spokesman review, and there was page after page of homes in our price range. Uh, I, they don't exist now. You know, the median price is 425000 or something. And that's really a failure of government. Um, but we can learn from our mistakes, and, and that's where our focus needs to be, is everything should be on the table. Converting empty office buildings downtown, uh, looking at the Growth Management Act, uh, any, anything and everything. But it's going to require us to put our political differences aside. And I don't believe that in my race this is a partisan thing. This is a competency and character. Who's going to best serve you uh, in your needs? There hasn't been a Democrat elected in the fourth for 30 years, right? So if you're unhappy with the way things are, put in another Republican in there and having them come back and say, well, I'm sorry, I can't get anything done because the majority party in Washington is a Democrat. I hope it's getting old. Uh, I, we, like I said earlier, we've already had Mr. Chase in office and we voted him out. I think it's time we send a Democrat there because I won't be able to use that excuse. I'm going to have to deliver and I'm, or I'm going to come back and look you in the eye and tell you why I didn't. And, and that's really what I want to say to people is uh, you've been down Mr. Chase's road. Let's, t- let's change. If you want to see more uh, s- small businesses prosper, if you want to see an increase in available in housing, if you want to see a decrease in crime, I'm saying I can deliver those for you. Yeah. Well, let's go back to public safety a little bit. Uh, I just expect a lot of voters in the district to kind of have that front of mind. I know the city of Spokane Valley is looking to secure more funding to hire more officers. Uh, I guess as a legislature, what would you do um, on the public safety front? So it it is. uh, You've seen uh, Bob Ferguson's ads about, you know, he's going to hire more police across the state. Um, and I and I support that. I, th- I support that uh, we have to get uh, in people's minds that they're secure, that they can walk downtown, they can shop, they can live in their neighborhoods and in their homes in peace and security. Um, at the same time, it's really it's more complicated than just putting officers out there and being punitive and, and charging people with crimes. We need to uh, make sure that everyone has the treatment and is we understand the difference between criminal activity and just substance abuse and uh, the frustration of, of being hopeless. Um, so while I support adding more police officers, we got to look at the funding for that. And I think, again, everything should be on the table. You know, if it's uh, redistributing the proceeds from the marijuana sales, uh, I've heard that suggestion. I'm all, I'm all in on listening to that. Um, but everything that we can to find the, the adequate number of law enforcement that we need on the street along with people that are qualified to de-escalate uh, when it's a mental health crisis and get people the treatment that they need. Yeah. Kind of those co-responder programs where it'll pair a yeah. mental health or addiction expert with a first responder. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I know education is another uh, area you're passionate about, uh, so I'd like you just to kind of share your thoughts there. And um, I know one of the kind of top issues right now is that a lot of public school systems are struggling with their funding mechanisms. We just saw a slate of bonds get rejected by voters here in the region uh, during the special election in February. Um, is that an area you would like to focus on, um, the funding specifically? And then just under education, uh, what would you hope to do? So education is key to everything. To be a prosperous, successful country, to move us forward, we have to have an, an educated populace, right? And my opponent has told me that he wants to cut public education in half and divert funds to home schools and charter schools. And I, I'm completely opposed to that. We need to fund, fully fund our public education. And, and I understand that... Uh, Taxes are not a popular thing, but if you're going to spend money on anything, it should be investing in the future of our children, our youth, and our young people so that they can create the the kind of country, the prosperous country that's going to lift everyone up. We need the advances in science and medicine and technology. We got AI on the horizon. We have all these challenges, and we have to have people that can think critically, 
which is another reason that when I hear, you know, this attacks on school, um, stacking school boards with people that want to ban books, um, just bring this vitriol and, and, you know, control what kids are learning by saying, we're not going to talk about critical race theory. We're not going to talk about critical thinking. We're going to, we're just going to give you what we think is acceptable. That's insane. That That's going to take us backwards. And we're not going back, right? That's the big democratic tagline. We're not going back. And I believe it. We need to go forward. The only way we can go forward is to make sure that our teachers, our educators are fully supported in, in everything they need. We need to make sure that our kids are ready to learn. So I'm in favor of making sure they have a breakfast and a lunch. We need to make sure that they have an activity after school so that they're not out there getting in trouble. And most of all, we need to challenge them to think. Banning books is, I never thought I would see anyone you know, uh, as a proponent of that in America. I, I, I would remember reading Catcher in the Rye and seeing the F word, and that was what, a freshman? Um, and thinking, oh, you know, this is a sign by the school. I, I must be a grown up. You know, we get to use words like this. But what it did is just stimulate me to, to read more. And, and the more I read, the more, the better my life got. Uh, the more I enjoyed life. I always say I'm 63 years old and I've never had a bad day. And that's true and I believe it. But I believe it because I've read so many books and had so much insight from great writers, you know, Steinbeck and Tolstoy and Dickens and all these different people that have shown me what the human experience is, right? I'm, I've been so blessed to have a stable family my entire life. I had a mother and father and, and four brothers and a sister and three brothers and a sister. And uh, I thought everyone lived the way that I did. Everyone came home and had a meal together. And I found out when I turned 18 and, you know, started to look around the world that I was the exception, that there were people out there that had no stability. So that's kind of, I'm getting off point here, but I think the way we get that kind of stability is through education, that we show people that the, the way that you deal with the world, uh, you're, you're not alone. There's all these writers out there that can give you these, these guidelines. You don't have to touch a hot stove. You, know, you, you can read about it. So you don't make those same mistakes. And you learn and you grow. And the more that you have understanding of the world, the more at peace you are because things make sense. You are able to critically think along with the whole practicality aspect. I'm just, that's kind of dealing with uh, your satisfaction in your personal life. But to train you in a skill of medicine or uh, being an electrician or a steam fitter or a welder, whatever is out there that you're interested in, um, it's available through our schools. Our schools can guide you there, help you, support you. But it takes money. It takes funding. And we have to get behind public education. We have to support it. And instead of tearing it down, let's find areas where it needs improvement. And then let's work with our educators to make those improvements. Well, thank you for, for kind of exploring that. Um, you're talking about education kind of being a pathway um, into that, you know, next step in life. Absolutely. And you've been, you know, a longtime union advocate and have said, you know, if elected, you'd advocate for the working class. So we've talked about housing, we've talked about education and public safety. Is there anything else, you know, specifically for the working class that you would like to focus on? I'm a 35 plus year steel worker. And uh, it, that's been a journey in itself for me. Uh, I grew up in a Republican household. Uh, my father did not support unions. As a young man, I, had, I thought I didn't need a union, never do anything for me. I'm a good worker, blah, blah, blah. What I was doing, though, is thinking like a scab. You know, a scab is a person that crosses a picket line. But, but in the broader concept, Except, uh, it, a scab is just a selfish, self-interested person, right? And that is a plague on our country right now. Unions lift up everyone. Unions have created the middle class and will again if we can get the union density up where it should be. We're what, 10, 12 percent of the population now are union employees. We're back in uh, the 50s, 60s, it was closer to 30 percent. And and that's where I, I think it should be. We have this enormous uh, income inequality in our country. And I think it's driving us in the wrong way. But we have to understand that the solidarity, the concept of a union 
is everywhere we're successful. We're successful as a nation when all 50 states stand together. We're successful in every endeavor. I said, you know, we built the, the Grand Coulee Dam and we put the, an international freeway system across our country. That was all done by working men and women, not scabs. That's not the individual. That's a collective effort from all of us coming together. That's not scary socialism and Marxism or communism. That's just uh, common sense. That's efficient. When we work together, and you see it in every organization, uh, even you know, groups like the Heritage Foundation, the Freedom Foundation, are essentially a union. They're coming together. They're working for the wrong objectives. They're working to keep people poor and ignorant, but they are working in a collaborative method and uh, effort for it towards a goal. That's how simple unions are. They're, they're essential, though, to rebuilding our, our middle class, to improving the quality of life for all Americans. And I think it's been rampant disinformation, propaganda, and lies that have really robbed us of, of support in unions, even though they're, they're polling higher than they have in decades. Um, we need to get past that stigma of their, that it's for the lazy worker. Unions only give us equal footing to deal with big corporations and unfair conditions. And they've, the changes and the, the good they have brought to our country in terms of safety and hours, work hours and environmental protections are incalculable. And we all, all owe a debt of gratitude to unions for that. Well, thank you, Ted. I um, As far as issues, is there anything else you wanted to touch on that we haven't yet? So I, I just really want to highlight the difference between uh, my views and my opponent's views. Um, his views, in my opinion, would just be ridiculous or weird if he was a private citizen. I think his views as an elected official, though, are harmful and dangerous. When he's out there advocating that COVID vaccines are, are dangerous, that vaccines give you autism, when he's uh, saying that January 6th, the insurrection was an inside job um, orchestrated by the FBI, 200 FBI agents in red hats. When he's undecided on whether immigrants are eating pets or not, if that's a true story. Um, his conspiracy theories of uh, all sorts, and I, I hope you get a chance to ask them, ask him about his views. Um, you know, eating ivermectin to treat a virus and, and a whole litany of, you know, crazy conspiracy theories. That is, as an elected official, if, if people are taking that advice, it could harm them. Now, I'm not a doctor, and I should not give medical advice, nor will I. But I will tell you that you should follow the county health board. You should follow the, C the CDC recommendations of the Surgeon General, at least right now, while we have legitimate people in an office. It's, uh, it's that uh, undermining of our systems that I find so dangerous. When you disparage you know, an integral part of our health protocols, that harms everyone. That's not your individual right to do that. Um, so he, as a private citizen, he can have his views. But as an elected official, if he's out there and, you know, telling people that you can't trust science, that you can't trust, you know, any institution because they're all part of the deep state, that destroys the one thing that makes our country work. And that's faith in one another. That's faith in our elected officials to do the right thing. So when you disparage or slander an institution, uh, I think it's just as wrong as you would destroy some person's reputation. It, it shouldn't stand. And in every member of our community that has prominence, a candidate or holds an elected official, I hope will step up and refute and, and denounce these views of, of my opponents as what they are, in my opinion, dangerous and harmful. They're going to take us back. They hurt our community. Yeah. Well, we do hope to uh, have Mr. Chase in here to have one of these conversations. We're trying to bring each of the candidates in, you know, so voters can no, absolutely. That's hear great. from them firsthand. Um, one of my last questions for you, um, you've not been shy about criticizing the Republican Party uh, in this race or in, you know, your past bids for office. Um, do you worry those criticisms could hinder your ability to attract voters across the aisle? Not one bit. Um, I have 
good friends on the Republican side um, that I have cordial discussions with. I sit down with Mr. Chase and and we had discussions. My criticisms of the Republican Party, I stand behind 100%. Um, I, you haven't asked me about my shirt, but I wear this uh, T-shirt with a picture of a man named August Landmesser on it. August is in, this is taken in the 1930s, some 90 years ago. He's in a shipyard, and everybody in this photo has their arms up in the air in allegiance to a man who's going to make the country great again, except for one. This man was caught in this picture with his arms folded and a scowl on his face because this man was married to a Jewish woman and had two half-Jewish children. And the state told him that wasn't okay. And they ended up imprisoning him and then killing him. And that sounds pretty wild, right? But I saw January 6th happen where there was a concerted effort to stop the peaceful transfer of power. We do not have to repeat the past, as I said earlier. And if we don't look at hi history critically, if we don't study it and learn from it, the old adages were doomed to repeat it. And that's absolutely right. That's why I bring it up. That's why I criticize the Republican Party that doesn't seem to have the integrity or the spine to stand up and say, that's wrong. Your hateful rhetoric is wrong. That this talk of being a dictator is wrong. The constant lying. The, you know, the subverting constitutional rights, the, all the things that have gone along and, and Republicans have either remained silent or gone along with and supported. It, it is a, it's contrary to what America is all about. We keep gaslighting Americans that um, so they say that, well, both sides do it. Um, I don't know. All, there's kind of confusion. Well, it's crystal clear. The Republican Party owns their top they're Donald Trump. They're top of their ticket. That man is so completely unfit to hold office that it, it's just abhorrent to me. So, yes, I'm running for state representative in the fourth, but I'm conscious all the time that if we lose our democracy, my position in the fourth isn't going to help anyone because we've lost the basis of, of what allows us to work and function the way we do now. It is it's nothing to play around with. And everyone needs to be reminded reminded of the dangers of when you when you say that you're going to be dictator for a day that should be immediately a disqualifier uh, we should be vigilant and guard our democracy our dem democratic republic um, so when when we have a 40 percent turnout I, I don't I don't understand it I, I would think what's going on in our nation right now, the constant lights and gaslighting and propaganda would motivate and energize everyone to get out and vote. And I guarantee you, I will not win this election. The, I'm running as a Democrat in a heavily um, favored Republican district, and I get that. But we could win if every Democrat got out, turned in their ballot, turned it in, and more importantly, Republicans looked at the two candidates and said, I'm not going to, even though I'm a Republican, even though I, I don't like Ted personally or some of his policies, he's rational and, and their Republican candidate is irrational. And he's not, he's not going to add to any conversation. While he's talking about um, immigrants eating pets or, or COVID vaccines or any of his crazy conspiracy theories, he's not serving you. He's not serving your best interests, making your commute shorter, helping with housing, helping with uh, climate change, which he doesn't believe in. And we need to have serious people in there, people that will use science, use data, and be able to work in, in an organized fashion with every party to make real improvements for the lives of the people in the fourth. Well, thank you, Ted. I am... Um... I'm just about out of questions. Is there any final thoughts you wanted to share before we wrap up? Uh, I'll think of them as soon as I walk out the door here yeah, later. That's usually but, how it goes. But uh, I would just encourage anyone that has concerns about me to reach out. Uh, TedCummings.com, my email address is there. My, I only have my personal phone. That's my campaign phone. It's just me running as a mini filer. I don't believe money is going to win the race in the fourth. It is, it's going to be... Does anything that I said resonate with you? And can you put partisan politics aside 
and just once look at the man or woman or whoever the candidate is and says, is this a genuine person? Is this a person of, of character? In my last race, I cited the West Point Cadet Pledge. I won't lie, cheat, steal, and most importantly, I won't tolerate those who do. Um, that, along with the basis of my, this year's campaign, is good people don't hurt other people. I think that's everything you need to know about a candidate. Am, am I halfway intelligent? Do I have the character? And do I have uh, proven uh, my, through my past life that I'm going to be able to deliver real results for you? Um, I believe I do. And I'm happy to share that with anyone and everyone. And uh, I, I, I will just say that Mr. Chase and I are 180 degrees on most things. There's a few things that he has done or said that I actually agree with and I applaud him for. But even a stop clock is right twice a day. So I'm going to continue to advocate for every group, you know, whether it's a religious group or, or LGBTQ or trans, whatever it is, what anyone feels unsafe or unwelcome in our community, that's an issue for me. And I'll be there to stand with them. Uh, I'll be there to stand with working men and women when they're negotiating their contracts or their workplace is unsafe or whatever their issue is. I'm all about wanting to serve the people to make this community better. But we have to do it by using facts, science, data. Mr. Chase's slogan is truth matters, and he's absolutely right. But uh, his concept of truth is, is really just perception, and his perception is wrong. Well, I appreciate your time and your thoughts today. Uh, thanks again, Ted. Thank you for doing this, Nick. I appreciate it.